understand Docker, let's first understand why we need containers and what are these containers. So let's say that if I want to set up my environment, what is needed? What is required? First, I need to provision VM with my guest operating system. On top of that, I have to set up users, profiles and everything. I have to install required softwares like Java runtime, web servers and all that stuff. I have to create users, deploy application on top of my web server and configuration properties, right? These are the steps involved in creating the application environment. Now, first understand what is the virtual machine, right? Now how it works. So I have a host operating system, which is a large machine, or you can think it like a rack. On top of that, there is a layer called virtualization, which is also known as hypervisors, which provides the ability to run VMs on top of my host operating system. So that's the layer which does all the translations for us. Now to deploy my virtual machine, I need to first choose my guest operating system. So my guest operating system and host operating system can be different as well. On top of my guest OS, I deploy all the required softwares, which is Java, database, all that stuff. And then I deploy my application on top. That's how my whole virtual machine looks like. If I want another virtual machine, I can spin up another virtual machine with another guest OS. And my guest OS can be of different also. I can have Windows guest OS, Linux, multiple types of guest OS running. Now the advantages with VM is that they provide very good isolation. So if my one VM is behaving bad, the VM2 is not affected at all. So if VM1 goes down, other VMs are still in running state. I can also allocate proper resources to each VM. I can allocate 4 GB to VM1, 8 GB to VM2 based on the need, and then they stay in the limit. So all these are very good use cases where VMs are very powerful. It works really well, and this has worked for years for us, right? Now, what is the disadvantage of VM? And one of the classical disadvantage that I see is running the guest OS on top of the host operating system. So generally, we end up having two operating systems running there, right? Now, let's understand more in detail. What are the challenges with the virtual machine model, right? So I have my CPU, RAM, disk consumed by guest OS is the extra utilization that I have to bear performance overhead because of the guest OS translation to host operating system by hypervisor. There is a cost overhead involved as well. Software licenses for guest OS, I have to pay for that as well. And I have to maintain, upgrade, patch all my guest operating system as well. So these are the challenges with virtual machine. Now, what would be best? Let's say if I want to have all the advantages of VMs, but without the disadvantage. Then I could think of very simple model, right? Let's get rid of the guest OS. If I can run my VMs without the guest OS, that would have been awesome, right? And that works really well. And that's what exactly container does for you. So in the container model, you have host operating system. On top of that, you have container runtime or container engine which is also in the first version used to call Linux containers, right? And the containers are lightweight and requires softwares that are there and application code. So guest overhead of guest OS is out there. So that's how each container, they provide isolations, they provide all other advantages of virtual machine. To achieve the objective of the virtual machine, Container uses two major philosophy of the Linux operating system, which is C groups and namespace isolation. C groups allows the limitation and prioritization of resources like CPU, memory, disk, network, all that is allocated through C groups. 
Namespace isolations allows complete isolation of applications view from operating environment, including your file system, network, users, everything. So that's how it achieves all the advantage of it. We can look into more details also if you are interested. You can just Google it and find more details around it. But generally, you don't have to deal with it. All this is taken care of by the container runtime. So let's look at from the other way around, from the packaging point of view. If I go in old days, we first had in the Java world, we just had dot class files. We used to deploy dot class files also. Then the packaging came, which added all the class files in a zip format, and we had a application dot jar file. Jar file is nothing but a fancy packaging of all the dot class files. Now that was not good enough. And then came the war file, which is nothing but web archive, which is a combination of all the dependent jar files and my application jar files combined together. Then came the EAR file, which is enterprise archive. When I want to deploy multiple web applications together, I can put them into one EAR and deploy. With the change, there is a concept came where why I have to run my web server outside? Can I bring it inside my package? That's where we had Spring Boot and others, which had a Uber executable jars where you have application.jar, your dependency libraries, and even your Tomcat server jars included and bundled together. Now you take it anywhere and run it. Now, if you take this analogy further, what is outside of the executable jar is your JDK, right? Your Java runtime and others. So if you imagine container is a, another level of packaging where you have your executable jars, you have your Java runtime, or your web servers, everything packaged together with a very thin layer of container, LXE, and then you are done. So your package of container is including all of this together. And that's what is container, right? Now take this container, which has all the properties, deploy it in the previous diagram that you have seen, where it runs on host operating system with the help of container runtime. And that's all about containers at a high level.